Monster Tajima is a really specific guy. It was a huge thing for me to meet him because uh, he was one of the guys I was looking up to when I started a company. Uh, kind of like a hero for me. I mean, he raced Pikes Peak the first time when I was just born in 1988. Uh, so he's really a legend, especially in Japan, but also all over the world. started working on the project. I was, I was amazed and afraid at the same time. But then I realized that we are actually going to build this. We're actually going to do a car that has 1.1 megawatt of power. At that moment you scratch your hand and think, you know, how can this be a 1,500 horsepower monster in, in a couple of months, uh, just this bare frame? First time they told me that uh, we were supposed to make a race car in four months, I thought, okay, that will be a challenge. I had never worked on a race car before. We were quite ready with the data already, so we had the CAD developed already, have done all the simulations, the battery pack was pretty developed, but then we had to actually build it. Um, what people think a car production is, is putting the car together, like the assembly. But for us, that's really the simple part. Uh, the complex part is to develop and produce the components. Uh, what I do is software. I do simulations, I do control systems. And at that moment, I think, uh, I was simulating the car going up Pikes Peak. My concern at that moment was whether the battery we have uh, envisioned will have enough capacity, whether the components will overheat, and what our time will be. From the technological side, we had two challenges. Uh, that were, I mean, there were a lot of challenges, but two ones that I really remember. So um, first, because it was an existing chassis, we had to package our powertrain. So the, the powertrain is basically very similar to the Concept One's powertrain, but the dimensions of the chassis didn't allow for the whole powertrain. So we had to make it shorter. And in order to do that, uh, we were designing a very special uh, transmission system. Uh, Everybody who looked at it said it will never work, so we basically wanted to make a chain drive. And because of the high transmission ratio, the final sprocket had to be very small and the motor sprocket had to be quite big. So it was a big ratio and everybody said like, this is never going to work, this is going to break. And the other challenge was the torque rectoring system. So as you know, we have the system with four motors, where each motor is controlled 100 times per second. And we have this uh, advanced algorithms where uh, each motor receives a dedicated torque 100 times per second to use the maximum out of the tires to control the car the perfect way in any given situation. A few days before the race, we had some problems. We didn't know that we could make it on the time because uh, we needed to go three days later to the Colorado to participate on the race, trainings. But we did overnights and overnights and we fixed the problem and the car was ready in just last second <laughs> to ship it uh, to Colorado. Possibly the biggest challenge here is tuning the torque vectoring system to fit a racing application. Before the Tajima project, we had only worked on hypercars, and as fast as they are, they also uh, need to provide a certain level of comfort. So, a lot of the signals that come in from the driver were delayed, filtered, so to speak, uh, to enable uh, a greater level of uh, smooth driving, that sort of thing. Mr. Tajima is a very direct driver, he's very aggressive. He used to do a lot of gravel and rally uh, races. So he's used to um, drive in a very specific way. He's a very aggressive driver, like he's not, he doesn't have clean lines, but he's you know, really driving attractively, getting the car sideways and sliding through the corners, um, which is cool and looks great, but uh, for a torque factory system, it doesn't really 
work well because the torque vectoring system's job is to keep the car from sliding. So this was quite tricky. We had to change the torque vectoring system to learn how, how Mr. Tajima wants to drive. Uh, so we had to adapt the system to him, but he also had to adapt a little bit to the system. And this experience really helped us to improve the system for our other cars because this was such an extreme driver and extreme condition in Pikes Peak that we learned a lot in a very short time. So basically, we, we took the Concept One torque vectoring and put it into Tajima's car, worked a lot on it, adapted it, and then after we were done, we said, okay, this is quite good and better than we what we had, so let's take this and put it back in our cars. So basically now, our cars have an evolution of the uh, Tajima's uh, torque vectoring system that was developed for him. It was a funny feeling to sit in a Pikes Peak car and to do the first test meters through the parking lot, actually. Um, the stress level with that is, you, 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 just, you just don't think about that at that time. Um, when, I, when we came back uh, from the first initial test, I said to myself that we did really, really some crazy, crazy stuff through, through this project. People always ask me how it feels when you get in the car the first time and try it. But it never really works that way. When you build such a project, it's very complex, you have thousands of parts. And you can never just for the first time assemble it and just hit the throttle and go. It's always gradually. You, first it's a success when the wheel turns or when you have communication between the systems, uh, when the bus system works, when the electronics in the car work, system by system you, you, you start to make the car alive. And then you start uh, the powertrain, the wheels turn for the first time, you do the first meters, then the first hundred meters, first thousand meters, you increase the power gradually, you increase the speed, you increase the pace. We expected that he would follow a similar path like we usually do in development. Uh, but he immediately, you know, jumped into the car, went to the racetrack and wanted full performance. So first time he was really disappointed. He was like, oh, this car is really slow. But we gave him just a little bit of power, you know. We didn't want to increase immediately because something, you know, you never know what can happen, what can go wrong. We wanted to know the performance figure. We wanted to know the, the power of the car. And the only place that we could measure the car was at uh, Akrapovic in Slovenia, when we put the car on the rolling road and uh, measured the car power. That was also a scary moment because nobody has ever, you know, done something like that. At least nobody that I know has put the car, the electric car, with 1.1 megawatt of power on the rolling chassis and just put the power down. One megawatt. One megawatt. This is a fantastic day. Memorial day. It was a unique experience, um, and when the numbers came out, everybody was obviously full of joy because we knew we made it. When Tajima san came for the second time, we had a prepared car with full power for him to go again on the Grobnik. And, uh, he was pushing to the limits all the time and he enjoyed it because it was fun to drive that car. This company is a quite young company, but their you know, attitude and their spirit and their mind is fantastic. Exactly my mind and my spirits. So now I am very happy because this is 100% best partner in the world. We didn't test everything, you know, uh, because there's so many things on the car. So when we went there, uh, I think our guys arrived there a couple of weeks before the race. So they were doing a lot of testing on different racetracks. The last week of training, when we were actually on the mountain, was pretty hard. So we would wake up at 2 in the morning, load up into trucks and go to the top of the mountain, where we'd assemble the car, check it and get it ready for the training run. 
uh, after we completed the training for the day, we would go back down the mountain and to another test track where Mr. Tajima would further tune the system. This meant that we were probably eight hours a day on the track and uh, uh, aside from that we needed to analyze the data from the, from the track and we needed to make any sort, any sort of adjustments to the mechanical and electrical components. The race was on Sunday about 10 o'clock in the morning and before the race Tajima was in a special mode, uh, very calm, concentrated, uh, sitting beside the car uh, on the chair. He went through the track, I think, three or four times, holding an imaginary steering wheel in his hands and just going through each corner. I think that shows how much experience the man has because he just has the entire track in his mind. He can do that sort of thing. It was quite astounding to watch and I think it calmed the entire team down. That racetrack is uh, one of the trickiest racetrack in the world because it's actually a public road and uh, safety uh, on that racetrack is not so high as on a racetrack. Um, they go really, really high speeds, uh, 20 kilometers of, of uh, challenging track. You have to be at the pinnacle of your uh, abilities, of your physical and mental state. Um, if you make a mistake, there's no turning back. During the race we had a pretty big problem, so just before a corner Mr. Tajima was going 180 km per hour and he lost his mechanical brakes in that moment. So first I think his front brakes overheated, which means he pushed the brakes harder, so the rear wheels locked for a moment and the car got sideways in a really dangerous corner where a big cliff is right next to it. So the car was unstable, he was trying to stabilize it without any brakes. In this case, it's a combination of the driver's skill and experience and the system's aiding effect, which saved the, the, the driver's life, probably. He was crazy enough to finish the race without any mechanical brakes. He just used uh, regenerative braking, another advantage of electric cars. So he could just, he could brake without the mechanical braking brakes really working. Of course, with less power, but still. Finally, when he finished second with his time, uh, 9.32, I think, minutes. Uh, that was great. All team was starting to crying <laughs> because it was very hard time for us uh, to do that car in a very small time. When he came back down and went out of the car, he first congratulated everyone. He thanked everyone for their hard work. He, he hugged his wife. Uh, I think he was very happy with it. A lot of people came to Buzet just to see the car and a lot of people came up to us directly and said wow this is an amazing thing you've done, I've been tracking your progress since 2015. It was really a morale booster for everyone who was there to see that uh, our work is appreciated. I wanted to, to drive the car, I didn't want to, to go slow. Uh, we wanted to, to do the race the proper way, but we didn't want to risk anything. Um, and at the starting line I was constantly thinking to myself, keep the trajectory, watch the brakes, watch the tires, they're cold, you have to warm them up uh, before you can use the full potential. Um, watch for the tricky parts on the, on the racetrack. You're concentrated the whole time and when you pass the finish line, uh, you feel that relief every time. This is what really you know, makes people astonished, especially people who didn't expect something like this from electric cars who never saw an electric race car in action. When we 
finish this car when we tried it on a racetrack, uh, from that moment on, I was absolutely, and I am still absolutely sure that uh, this is the future of, of racing. It's so superior to, to petrol engines that it cannot be measured. You don't have the gear shift, you don't have that noise. You can concentrate to other stuff that's been happening with the car. Racing is all about pushing the limits and developing new technologies, which eventually make it also in the consumer cars. Traditional racing series are getting more and more electrified, like Formula One or uh, Le Mans with their hybrid powertrains. And this is a playground where you can really, I think, you know, experiment with new technologies. If the uh, manufacturers are bold enough and, and crazy enough, they can really do a lot there. But also, uh, there are new things coming, like autonomous driving, which will change the world of racing, uh, where drivers might not be necessary in some of the series in the future. For me, to work on a car like this uh, was a great, great honor, and uh, to work with uh, the guy, uh, the, the most famous driver of Pikes Peak with uh, Mr. Nobuhiro Tajima was a huge, huge honor. You know, they say don't meet your um, heroes, you'll be disappointed, but in his case uh, I was really surprised by uh, how enthusiastic he is, uh, how supportive he was for the project and just such a positive and incredible guy. Yeah.